Hi everybody, it's Big Anklevich here with a very special episode of the Anklecast. That's right, Rish uh, encouraged me to do this. My The Anklecast was supposed to be a super easy podcast where I just get on, I talk, I don't do any editing, I just put it straight out and give it to the people. Um, and there's none of that uh, work involved in editing things down because I wouldn't be able to do the ankle cast if that was the case because I don't have time to do all that work. Um, but Rish uh, really thought the idea behind the, uh, you know, behind these is more a way to share more of his own stories. So he does that on his Rish Outcast, which I think has one or two episodes is all so far. That's one of those things we need to get in order of as far as that goes. But, uh, but yeah, I didn't want to do stories, but he encouraged me. And I remember last year at this time, I had the idea that I, I have football related story. And I thought, oh, I'll share that as a kind of a, a special thing to everybody now that it's Super Bowl time of the year. And then I didn't get around to it. It was too close. You know, I didn't have enough time to even read it and edit it anyways. And so I skipped out on that. But this year, I already was ready ahead of time. And Rish and I recorded it together. So it's a, a full Dune Steve production, not just a big Anklevich production. And uh, yeah, I've got this story. Um, it's called The Tomorrow Bowl. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Check it out. The Tomorrow Bowl by B. D. Anklevich. Coach Hugh Henniger led the 49ers onto the field through a tunnel of shaking pom poms and spitting fireworks. He couldn't believe. After all the years of his life he dedicated to this game, that he was finally here, the Super Bowl. Ghosts of the great Niners of the past flitted through his mind. Jerry Rice, Steve Young, Ronnie Lott, Deshaun Hernandez, and the inimitable Joe Montana, urging Hugh to do them proud. The NFL film's theme music for the Super Bowl played on a loop in his head. In his youth, he'd watched almost everything that studio had ever produced, at least what remained in the C-131 archives, seeking out even the rarest videos. It was those videos that had inspired him to make the gridiron his life's pursuit. And now he was here. It had all been worth it. The hundreds of people in the bleachers cheered wildly as his 49ers took the field, followed closely by their arch-rival, the Steelers. Recirculators roared to life, sucking the smoke and replacing it with healthy, breathable air as the team's captains gathered at the center of the field for the coin toss. The Nouveau Paris Steelers won the first victory of the day, calling heads when heads was flipped. Hughes Chicago 49ers lined up and kicked off the ball to start the first Super Bowl of the modern era. Luckily, his special teams had listened to his nearly endless pregame harangue, and they'd kept their lanes and tackled correctly, and Hugh didn't have to watch the opening kickoff run all the way back for a touchdown. The opening drives were ugly for both teams. Maybe it was nerves, or maybe the defenses were just more prepared than the opposing offenses. But either way, both teams went three and out their first time with the ball. Hugh grabbed his quarterback when he trotted off the field after failing to connect with two dismally off-target throws in that first drive and sat him down on the bench. What's going on in your head, Masamba? Those passes were probably the worst two you've thrown this season. Sorry, coach. I was scared. I was scared I'd screw up out there. It's a Super Bowl. Yeah, well, that worked out well, didn't it? You did screw up out there. Now pull it together. It may be the Super Bowl, but it's just another game. If you spend the whole time worrying about screwing up, then that's exactly what you'll do. Get out there and play your game. Show them why you're the MVP, all right? All right, coach. The improvement wasn't immediate, but eventually, Masamba settled down and started making the throws that he had been completing the whole season through. 
Masamba was the reason the 49ers were in the Super Bowl to begin with. But now that he was back in form, Hugh didn't worry any further. With Masamba on his game, the 49ers easily outmatched the upstart Steelers. By halftime, Hugh's team had gained a 10-point lead to take into the locker room. Hugh didn't get to follow them, however. He was part of the halftime spectacular. It wasn't nearly as spectacular as halftimes had been in the pre-Holocaust days, before all the humans who hoped to survive fled to underground bunkers that eventually grew into underground cities and nations. It was nothing like having a performance from Paul McCartney, New Kids on the Block, or Janet Jackson's Bare Nipple, but it was as spectacular as a game played before 1,348 people was able to muster. The lights dimmed, and a multimedia presentation documenting Hugh's story played on the big screen. The first thing that appeared was the ancient pre-Holocaust NFL films video that had so captivated Hugh as a young man. Hulking men, armored in plastic helmets and pads, smashed together in slow motion. Like the gladiator films he'd seen. But this was real, not movie fakery pretending to illustrate epic clashes. The screen faded to black, and the narrator spoke of how football, along with everything else, was lost when the nukes were unleashed on humanity. Then a picture of a young Hugh faded in, and the narrator spoke of a visionary who wanted to restore at least this one part of mankind's past to the present. There was video of Hugh's early games, when he couldn't even drum up enough people to field a full team or warrant a chamber big enough to house a hundred-yard field. They played using arena football rules then, but Hugh's dream was to be Joe Montana, so eventually he'd have to recruit some more people. As time passed, others came, and within ten years he was able to field many full-size teams in his home city-state of Chicago, named after that long-lost city of the past. Hugh grew old, and he couldn't make his body perform like it needed to any longer, but he wouldn't give up on the game he loved, so he began coaching from the sidelines instead of from the huddle, as he'd done until then. The game kept growing in popularity, and other city-states picked it up. Being pent up inside of a cave was never the way men were meant to live, and football served as a needed outlet for suppressed restlessness and aggression. The video showed the formation of the Gridiron League, Hugh and several other nutcases from various city-states had gotten together and put together the first international sports league since mankind had fled underground from a firestorm of their own making. Finally, it showed video from earlier in the day, when Hugh had led his team out onto the field. He was impressed that they could manage to get that video in so quickly. Then, it ended with video of Super Bowls from pre-Holocaust days. Some day, said the narrator, the Super Bowl will return to its former glory and will owe it all to the vision and tenacity of Hugh Henniger. He was in tears when the lights came back on. The presentation had encapsulated his life's dream into one five-minute piece of media, and it had touched him deeply to see the appreciation that others had for his work. Perhaps it was right, too. Perhaps the Super Bowl would return to its former glory some day. He just hoped that it happened while he was still around to see it. Barry LeBrock, the league's commissioner, presented Hugh with a special Super Bowl ring to commemorate his efforts. Thanks, Barry, Hugh said. I really appreciate this, and I hope you don't take it wrong when I say that this ring isn't enough for me. Now I'm going to get to the locker room and get my guys ready to win the real ring here today. The 49ers faithful erupted into a huge cheer at that comment, and they screamed loudly until Hugh finally disappeared into the tunnel that led to the locker room. Maybe it was because Coach Hugh spent too much of halftime away from the locker room, but the second half went badly. The Steelers' defense stiffened, and Masamba had trouble generating any yards. The Steelers' offense also found new life, and with four minutes left in the fourth quarter, the 49ers let in the go-ahead score. Hugh's dream was slipping away from him. His team trailed by two points, and the game was coming to an end. But Masamba Thomas, the game's best player, was getting the ball at the perfect time to turn himself into the new era of football's first legend. The kickoff was a high, end-over-end -end affair that nearly hit the dome's roof and went all the way out the back of the end zone. 
Hugh grabbed Masamba as he headed out to the field. All right, kid, he said. It's your chance to be the hero. We got four minutes, so we're going to do a few running plays as well. I want to keep them honest. Right, coach. It was a pass first, and Masamba hit the tight end for four yards. Then a draw play, which caught the defense completely off guard, and Steve, the running back, scampered down the left side for 15 yards. The run succeeded in keeping the defense honest, and Masamba was able to complete two more passes for 10 yards each. In no time flat, they were in field goal range. With the offense moving so well on this last drive, Coach Hugh wanted them to keep running plays until either they were in the end zone or they had to kick the field goal because they were out of time. So they pushed onward to the 30-yard line and on the next play to the 20-yard line. Then it happened. With only 45 seconds left in the game, Masamba dropped back for another pass. He had a receiver breaking free from coverage and speeding toward the end zone. He pump faked once, and as he brought the ball toward his chest, was clobbered from the blind side by a hulking linebacker wearing the number 56 on his jersey. The ball came out and squirted around on the turf until a black-shirted Steeler finally fell on it to the sound of numerous whistles. The game's over, thought Hugh. The game is over and we lost. His heart had leaped into his throat while his stomach had dropped through the ground. But to Hugh's astonishment, the referees were waving their arms in the signal that indicates an incomplete pass. That couldn't be right. Hugh had seen it from here, and it was clearly a fumble. He had to get the story. Hey, Mike! He yelled across the field at the referee, who looked up at the sound of Hugh's distinctive gravel. Get over here and tell me what's going on. The ref dutifully trotted across the field to Hugh's side. Was that a fumble? Hugh asked. No, no, you're okay. It was an incomplete pass. How was that an incomplete pass? You're not pulling strings to help me win this game because I'm me, are you? Hugh demanded. No, I swear. We all love you, Hugh, but this has nothing to do with that. It's the tuck rule that you told us about years ago. The one with the Patriots and the Raiders. Oh, no. You're telling me I'm going to win because of the tuck rule? I thought we got rid of that rule. Nope, said the ref. And, ironically, it was the Steelers who cast the deciding vote to keep it. So don't feel bad. You deserve it. Now, are you going to win the game, or what? We'll do our best, Mike. Thanks. The tuck rule. It had besmirched the New England Patriots of old, who won three Super Bowls in four years, but they'd reached the first of them by way of a bad rule that shouldn't have been part of the game. If the quarterback's arm is in forward motion when he's hit and fumbles, it's ruled as an incomplete pass, even if the quarterback was actually trying to tuck the ball away and run and had no intention of actually releasing the ball. Masamba had been meaning to release the ball moments later when his receiver was closer to the end zone, but the ball had been knocked from his hand before he could do that. Now, with the aid of a goofy rule, Hugh would get a second chance to win the game. He sent in his kicker, who booted it through the uprights as the last seconds ticked off the clock. The 49ers had beaten the Steelers by a single point, and Hugh and his team were the very first Super Bowl champions of the modern era. A cannon boomed, belching forth a small load of red, gold, and white confetti over his celebrating players' heads. The crowd, small as it was, screamed as loud as if it were ten times larger in number. Maybe someday soon it would be. It hadn't happened like he'd hoped. He would wanted to win the big one with authority and domination, like Lombardi's Packers, not by the skin of his teeth like Belichick's Patriots. But one way or another, he had just coached his team to victory in the first Super Bowl of the new era. He hoped there would be many more to come. Okay, so there you go. That was the story that I wrote. I wrote this a few years ago. I want to say Liz Mierzewski had the uh, idea of doing the 25 stories in 12 months thing. Um, and I was doing that with her trying to achieve that. And this was early on in that uh, whole thing. I think I just finished writing uh, Battle of Ideas. 
and I was like, okay, I need another story, and Battle of Ideas was insanely long, so why don't I try a short one? So I thought I would write a story about uh, this guy who was trying to reestablish the Super Bowl in a futuristic, post-apocalyptic world. Um, Slugbug Red, I just slugged you. Oh, sorry, I'm getting off topic. Uh, but anyways, yeah, this this story, if uh, if you heard my other story, was an incentive episode. Uh, I want to say it was called Something Out There. It was the one about a guy who runs into a mutant spider woman, and he falls in love with this mutant spider woman, and this mutant spider woman eats him, basically, is what happens. Uh, this is set in that same world. Um... Yeah, it's kind of a setting that I've had in my head since I was a, a young guy. I, I, I want to say there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles role-playing game that somebody had when I was at like a Boy Scout camp out. And they were all playing this and he got everybody to play it and, and come up with uh, characters and stuff like that. And so by way of that, I kind of incorporated mutants of, you know, half animal, half uh, people kind of mutants into a, a futuristic world, and yeah, in my head I came up with this whole, you know, post-nuclear holocaust, people had to flee to underground cities, the underground cities, uh, you know, at first they were just caves and stuff, and, and bunkers and that kind of stuff, but they eventually, uh, you know, hollowed out a civilization down there. And, uh, and yeah, the idea of just the things, that's one of those things that I've had in several different, uh, you know, worlds that I've created, just post-apocalyptic worlds that, where things happen, and then as people are getting back to society, how it would be to try and bring something that didn't exist, or that used to exist, to bring it back. Um, I was thinking once, and I think I may have even started writing the story, just how it would be interesting to write a story about a guy who lived in this post-apocalyptic world reinventing pasta and stuff, you know, because these are things that would go away. Like, everything would go away in, in, you know, when an apocalypse happens, and who knows, like, will somebody that knows how to make pasta exist? Um, or will all those people be dead and it has to be reinvented? You know, all the, the things that we take for for granted, uh, you know, what will it take to, to reinvent those things? And in this case, um, you know, they had, obviously they were uh, expecting uh, that a possible nuclear holocaust could come. And so these people were relatively well prepared, you know, they set aside, you know, the knowledge was preserved. They, they had, you know, for example, this guy was watching the NFL films recordings. So, you know, all, a lot of these things were, were put somewhere where they would survive a, a nuclear blast. They were down in a cave somewhere set aside and then, you know, their seeds and those kind of things, those that stuff was all saved in this society, so they weren't terribly, they wouldn't have to reinvent pasta, because they could just read a book about it, if they had to, um, but they did have to recreate the Super Bowl, because that was something that just, you know, it, it had gone away, and people hadn't played football for generations, and, but this guy saw these movies where they just, you know, they saw the amazing spectacle of the Super Bowl and wanted to uh, make that happen again. And obviously this is the very first one, so it's a long ways from happening again, because the crowd is just a few hundred. But I, I think it's neat, the idea. It's not a, an amazing story. It, there's nothing earth-shattering or exciting that happens in it. Uh, it's just a football game that happens basically I don't really get into a lot of the other stuff and so it's it's not uh, the kind of thing that's going to light somebody's fire I don't think but I think it's cool 
Oh, I think a guy just has a blowout on his trailer ahead of me. I'm gonna stay back until this guy figures out he's got a flat tire. Yikes. Oh, looks like he's starting to pull over now. <laughs> or is he? Yeah, he is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just don't want to be killed while I'm podcasting. and get too close to a guy with a blown tire. Um, yeah, that tire is so blown to pieces. Uh, now I've lost my train of thought. I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, it's, for me, I'm a huge football fan. I've loved football since I was, you know, barely old enough to know my own name. Um, so, you know, I've loved football since before I loved the particular team that I love. I loved football. I, I've liked different teams. When I was a little little kid, I thought the Steelers were the greatest because they had Terry Bradshaw, and how can you not love that? And uh, I cycled through a couple other teams before I finally made the bad choice of deciding that I was going to be a Minnesota Vikings fan. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've always just loved football, and... and professional football, I should say, especially. Um, I'm not as nearly as big of a college football fan. Um, or an NCAA fan, which is funny, Rich just told me the other day, he just discovered for the first time that NCAA wasn't basketball. He just thought NCAA was basketball because, you know, you hear about the NCAA tournament in March, and that's what he thought it was. And I told him, well, it's not only basketball, it's also you know, he was saying it was football, and I was like, it's not only football, it's also basketball, and then he was confused, and I had to explain to him that it's the National Collegiate Athletic Association is what that stands for, so it's all college sports, but, but anyways, um, yeah, I'm not as big a fan of college football as I am of professional football, I love professional football, I love the Super Bowl, I love the history of it and everything, um, and I love, and I think a lot of it comes from NFL films and how much I love NFL films and the, the, the stuff that they put together. They're just so, such amazing things. I've been watching them since I was a little kid. And so I can understand how Hugh Henniger would be inspired to create this by way of watching NFL films. Um, it's very cool. Uh, I'm. It, it kind of sad. I'm not really excited about the Super Bowl. Uh, obviously, my team isn't in the Super Bowl, but that's the way it is every year, so it's not that big of a deal. But there are certain teams that I like better than other teams. You know, I can I can stand some teams. I kind of like some teams. I hate other teams. And I hate when we get to this time of the year because all the teams that I like best, or even that I like, uh, tend to go away. I really don't like the Broncos. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's just because they've won been to so many Super Bowls while my team has done nothing but lose. Uh, I didn't feel so bad for them. I mean, I didn't dislike them as much when they went and finally won a couple Super Bowls after having lost so many. But uh, now I just, I, I, I've had enough of them and I don't really care for them and I like Peyton Manning, I'll have to admit, um, but I like Tom Brady better. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't know. Um, it'll be nice, I guess, for Tom, or for Peyton Manning to get a second Super Bowl. I kind of hope he wins because, uh, you know, I don't know. If, if nothing else, I hate, hate the New York Giants. And I think that Eli Manning is a putz and a, and a loser. And it makes me sad to think that Peyton Manning has won less Super Bowls than Eli Manning. Um, so I'm hoping that that gets remedied. I have nothing against the Seahawks, but I'm not a big fan of them either. Uh, at least it's not the 49ers. I, I dislike the 49ers more than I dislike 
the Seahawks for sure. But yeah, I got nobody in this fight this year, so uh, whatever, um, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll figure somebody out to root for. Usually that happens while I'm watching the game. You'll eventually, after a couple of quarters, you know, you start realizing that you want this team to win over that team. And it uh, doesn't always work out, but, uh, you know, I just hope uh, that it's a good game is all that I hope. And, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the story. Um, I know that I'm sure Rish would rather uh, eat a bullet than <clears throat> listen to a football story. But... Uh, I think there's got to be some listeners out there that enjoy football because there's a lot of people that watch football, so we've got to have at least a small percentage of our listeners that like it. And um, I will try to write more stories like this, not football stories per se, but short stories uh, that I can share on the AnkleCast as well as more stories to share on the main show. Uh, that is my plan to get as many of our stories out there so that people can start to recognize our writing and can hopefully look forward to having our writing on there. And, uh, yeah, Rish has been getting on my case to get stories available on Smashwords um, so that they're available for purchase uh, as e-books. You could... You could uh, read. I think he wanted me to get this for the love of the game. No, it's not called for the love of the game. I think I killed that. Oh, that's something I didn't talk about. I should talk about that really quick. Uh, I didn't have a good title for this story. I didn't know what to call it, and I think I just called it for the love of the game, which I think that was a movie about baseball as well uh, with Kevin Costner in it or something like that, where he was a pitcher pitching a perfect game. I can't remember. But uh, I think that's just kind of a rip-off title. Rich suggested I call it the Tomorrow Bowl. And so I decided to change it to that. Um, I don't know if it works or if it's way better I, I, or if it telegraphs things too much. I kind of wanted it, you know, you don't know what's going on with this. You know, you think it's a regular Super Bowl until you find out there's hundreds of people in the stands instead of thousands. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, I, I went with that title. Just it seemed better. It's more original, if nothing else. For the love of the game is a total generic, means nothing kind of a title. Um, but yeah, Rish wants me to try and get this story, uh, Tomorrow Bowl, available on Smashwords before I put the angle cast out of it, or at least at the same time or close to it. I still need to listen or read the, the uh, guidelines for Smashwords. So, and what I understand what Smashwords does is you put your story onto Smashwords and as long as you did it right, it will create a file that's a Mobi file, it will create an EPUB file, it will create a file that goes to all the different uh, publishing platforms for you and then they will put them on those platforms so you can get, uh, you know, you can buy, you, somebody can go to Amazon and buy your story, or they can go to Barnes & Noble and buy your story, or they can go to, you know, any of the different places and buy your story, or they can buy it from straight from Smashwords. But, uh, yeah, as, as long as you do it right, if you don't do it right, then it just sits on Smashwords only, and... I'm sure, you know, hardly anybody shops Smashwords compared to Amazon. So, uh, I guess the real key is making sure that you get it on to get it on correctly. So, I need to read those uh, guidelines and make sure that I do it correctly so that I can get my story out. I don't want to have to keep rejiggering it. Uh, yeah, I said it. Um, to uh, get it to... To... Uh, do what it's supposed to do. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe I'll do that. Uh, we'll see if I have time. Having time to get the story on AnkleCast at all is a bit of a win. So, you know, I don't want to press it too much. But I do want to get to that too. That's one of those things. 
talked about uh, being excited uh, about the podcast after New Media Expo the last time on the show. And uh, that's one of the things that, you know, Scott Sigler said to do is you got to have stuff out there for people to purchase. He sells his books um, that way ebooks and I think he does print on demand ones probably too uh, or maybe he has a real I think he has a real publisher maybe even but uh, you know he sells his books that way and makes the money off of them and that's how he makes money and, and you know is able to uh, he's able to live off of that and I'm thinking that that's going to be my goal is to be able to live off of my writing and you know me and Rish to be able to live off our writing I should say Rish always talks about you know he, he always jokes about how like certain people are able to buy their own homes you know that's that's his uh, you know the 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 level that you have made it you're a success if you're able to buy your own home by way of your work and he's always uh, bemoaning the fact that, like, the guy who wrote the lyrics for the I'm the Map song on Dora the Explorer owns his own home, and yet here's Rish, doesn't own his own home. Um, and, you know, he says the world is not fair, but I think Rish could own his own home using just... He could probably do it with just stuff he's already written. He has that many stories. Um, if we just got them out there and promoted them the way that we should uh, so you'll probably hear a lot more of that uh, as things come on I hope you guys like the story and uh, you can look forward to I'm sure a little more of that this year thanks for listening and I'll talk to y'all next time take two I don't even know I, I, this story is not good but we're going to do it anyways and I'll just throw it on ankle cast I don't even remember what it was called. I think it was called For the Love of the Game. There it is. For the Love of the Game. Oh, for the love of the game. The NFL film's music theme for the Super Bowl played on a loop in his head. Why music theme and not theme music? Because We'll say it the other way and see which yeah, sounds better Probably works ears. better that way, because that's normally how people say it. Like I said, the story's not good. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, coach. I was scared. I was scared I'd screw up out there. It's a Super Bowl. Wait, how do you want him to talk? <laughs> less, less Stallone. <laughs> sorry, coach. I was so scared. I'm sorry, coach. I was scared. I was scared I'd screw up. Now he sounds like the same guy. Um, sorry, coach. Sorry, coach. I was scared. It's really scary out there. There's big guys. They're trying to tackle me. The 49ers faithful erupted into a huge cheer at that comment. Yay. Maybe it was because Coach Hugh spent too much time of... Whoops. Maybe it was because Coach Hugh spent... What? But the second half went badly. The Steelers' defense stiffened. That's what she said. <laughs>